All right, thank you for having me here. Hope you guys have charged up on coffee. I'm excited to be here. My name is Robert Luciani. I have an academic background in algorithm design and formal logic, um, technical computing, at, uh, cloud computing at Microsoft, and business development and innovation at Tele2. So let's begin. Ask ourselves, why, and be honest, why is there so much hype around the topics we're discussing today? I'll tell you. It's because data science is more than just technology. I'm not gonna stand here and tell you about the convergence properties of some sort of algorithm. Data science is more than just an IT initiative. Data science is more than just uh, a, a BI project or drawing some pie charts. At its core, data science is about business transformation. And this is what we all know implicitly. We know it and we know that that means making money. So the ultimate goal is to make money on data science. That's what the opportunity is, and that's why there's so much hype around it. And so naturally, every company has a big data initiative to capitalize on this opportunity, and every vendor has a silver bullet that'll solve this uh, challenge that lies ahead of us. The similarities to the internet revolution of the 90s is uncanny. All of the hopes, all of the disillusionment, and all of the success stories, they're all there. This is Amazon's first website that they released in 1996. And what I think is cool is that, you know, they didn't start by hiring a bunch of HTML programmers and ask them to build a website, which was the 90s equivalent of setting up a big data platform. No, they started out with a complete vision for e-commerce and then had a corresponding strategy to match which led to them being the successful company that they are today. And so similarly, for the big data initiatives that are in your company, it's not enough to just hire technically talented people and set them to work on a new big data platform. You need to have a complete vision for what you want to achieve that is bought in by the leadership of the company and have a corresponding data-driven development strategy to match. Okay. Where does the data scientist fit into this? Well, I think uh, it's a little bit a question of semantics because we've had for a long time people that know how to mine using SQL, create statistical models, or visualize data in a neat way. But to simply rebrand ourselves as data scientists doesn't, doesn't really uh, mean a lot, if you ask me. So perhaps the smartest way is to begin by asking ourselves, wh what is it we expect from a data scientist? And so the prototype job description of a data scientist, I believe, is the following. Given data as your primary work asset, use modern data technology to give our company a competitive advantage. So we have the means. The means is modern data technology, and the expected outcome of the data scientist's work is a competitive advantage in the marketplace. So what skills are necessary to work with this? Well, you need to be good at data and you need to be good at science. On the data side of things, I feel three skills are really a prerequisite. The ability to program well, the un an understanding of contemporary machine learning, and experience with high performance computing. I haven't listed mathematics here because mathematics are implicitly necessary in any kind of science that you do, and in particularly here, a very broad range of mathematics from graph topology to a number of things. But the second aspect of a data scientist that is equally important, if not more important, and is surprisingly often overlooked, is the science half, or the science skill set. Normally in academia, a scientist has to study, hypothesize, experiment, iterate several times, and then disseminate the knowledge that was gained in this process to the people. If we rephrase this a little bit in the context of business, what we have is an individual that first and foremost needs to understand the business, the KPIs, the business pains, what the ambitions of the business are, and how they relate to the competitive landscape. Otherwise, what is it we're really aiming for? Secondly, the person, once, that th once that's understood, needs to develop capabilities and products from scratch that enable the intended outcome. And then finally, and this is the property that's the most difficult to find in individuals, is the ability to evangelize and communicate, the ability to have a vision, to create a vision from scratch for an intended outcome, to be engaging, to be charming. All right, so you have your data scientist, 
and you want to use modern technology. Modern technology is the secret weapon for the business advantage. Where do you start? Well, let's take a case in point here. Generally speaking, turnkey solutions are about five to 10 years behind what you will find presented at ICML or NIPS right now, the premier machine learning and data conferences. And a good example is the random forest algorithm. We'll just take that. Um, it's an algorithm that can help you classify things or predict values. It was invented by Leo Bremen in 2001, and he released his own version of it, his own code, a couple of months after he published his paper. One of the first large commercial companies to release a commercially supported version of this, uh, as can be expected, was the SAS Institute. So they were first out with giving this, but it was 10 years after the algorithm was first published. And given what we know about how relatives of random forest have absolutely dominated machine learning competitions, one can't help but think to, you know, what, would it, what competitive advantage would it have given a company to have this sort of algorithm 10 years ago when nobody else had it and it was that much better? Okay, well, science moves on, and what's state of the art today is deep learning deep learning algorithms. Deep learning algorithms have the ability to understand complex nonlinear data. And so what we see here is a nice little spiral of red points, and poor old random forest has no idea what's going on. It's overfitted a lot, whereas the deep neural network has easily wrapped around and understood what's going on here. Another example here is a data set of Newswire articles, where you know the classical principal component analysis method really doesn't know what's going on, and, and the data is just a big jumble, which words are important, which words are not important, whereas the autoencoder has trivially not only found all eight categories of news articles, but arranged the words in order of importance from least important in the middle to most significant on the, uh, on the edge. The difference between these two categories of technologies is game-changing, in my opinion, and really lies at the heart of the big data revolution. It's the intelligence applied to the data in a, in a meaningful way. Modern convolutional networks, which are also a type of deep learning, are getting so good now that with 5,000 training examples can achieve outstanding performance in finding pictures, understanding what's going on in them, seeing you know, which direction the car is parked in, and that sort of thing. But even further, now that we have this much data, with 10 million training examples per class, convolutional networks outperform humans in image detection, finding faces, finding things in images. And pay attention also to the timescales we're talking about here. Things are accelerating, in specific the past four years, given the advent of dedicated hardware for helping these types of calculations. One thing that I'm very excited about, in particular, are called generative models. Models that can invent their own uh, uh, output. So what we have here is a picture of Van Gogh's Starry Night painting and a photo taken of a little river in Amsterdam. If you feed this to uh, a special convolutional network and ask it, what do you think a combination of these two pictures might look like? You get Van Goghsterdam. And it's really cool. It's, it's, this wasn't programmed, obviously. It was straight out of the imagination of the neural network. So generative models are super duper cool. These technologies are what are driving what you see as a little bit of science fiction, self-driving cars, uh, Skype that can translate in real time between Arabic and Swedish or other languages. And in specific here, I, did anybody watch uh, the Deep, uh, um, Deep Mind matches last week? Yes? It was so cool. Deep learning and reinforcement learning were what uh, allowed Deep Mind's program to beat Lee Seedall in Go. And only a year ago, people thought it would take at least another decade to beat humans at Go. It's an exciting time, to say the least. These are the tools that these big companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Baidu, and others are using to actually work with machine learning. I like MXNet a lot because it has APIs and allows you to program in C, R, Python, Scala, and my favorite language for scientific computing, Julia, take note. Uh, but all of these frameworks here, I don't think they're very well known. They're all open source and they require a bit of programming skills to work with. On the upside, despite what you might have heard, your competitors are in all likelihood not using them yet. Infrastructure hasn't been standing still either. This workstation here has four GPUs in it. 
GPUs are the kinds of cards you use to play video games. So this is a very good gaming machine, but it's also very good for other things. One of these Titan X, that's a G GeForce card, but Titan X card costs about 1,000 euros. There are more expensive cards as well. But four of those cards there can outperform when it comes to uh, linear algebra and machine learning, a 70 node compute cluster. That's to say, this one workstation outperforms 70 servers with 16 cores each. When it comes to graph computations, super exciting. Everything is a graph. This thing outperforms your cluster a 100 times over. So it's, it's very neat. You might be thinking at this point, this all sounds very esoteric and exotic and it's neat science fiction, but it is very applicable. And let me give you two examples in retail because that's all I think I have time for now. Um, the first option you have in data science is you want to optimize what you're already doing. Anywhere the word optimize comes up, you can apply machine learning. It's about optimizing things you're doing. A good case is Zalando, the online fashion retailer. They get thousands of orders per hour. They had three guys that worked for three weeks and implemented a deep learning model using a workstation, not unlike the one I showed you there, with two K40 GPUs, to build a model that optimized the picking uh, travel time of employees in the warehouses by 11% over what they already thought was an optimized model. That's one hour of work per employee per day for three weeks of work. That's real money. The second opportunity you have is data-driven development, which means to develop your current products or new products with insights that you derive from data. And a nice example again in in retail and fashion is eBay, one of the largest companies, retail companies in the world that has, in practically speaking, zero tangible assets. And one of the things they've been publishing recently that I also think is very cool are classif uh, 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 classifiers that can find what clothes a person is wearing from a selfie picture. Uh, they know what fashionable people are wearing and can recommend new clothes that this person might be interested in. It really works today. And I started thinking when I saw this the first time, how could I implement um, generative models to it? And uh, you can actually start with very small data sets of 700 pictures, getting the computer to start imagining its own dresses and clothes and that kind of thing. The possibilities are endless. The point here is that I've given you two examples from retail, but this is applicable across industries and quite trivially so, if you have the right skills. So. You know, in telecom, you can use real-time voice translation on the PCM backend. That can be done today. In, in uh, utilities and manufacturing, you can make real uh, sensor networks, smart sensor networks. In finance, you can do high-order polynomial risk calculations in real time all the time and get really good precision. So, in conclusion, I want to say that in order to drive a big data initiative, Data skills and technical competence, they're a prerequisite. You need to have them in place. But if you want to excel, if you want to beat your competition, you need to have the vision, the ambition, and the passion of a scientist as well, a data scientist. Thank you.